this time to present noted attorney F. Lee Bailey. Mr. Bailey is especially well qualified to join with us today for our airing of the issues. As many of you know, aside from his active involvement over the years as an attorney for some of this country's most celebrated cases, Mr. Bailey was one of the founders of PATCO. Unfortunately for the controllers, he left that organization before they ran into difficulty, or perhaps the outcome would have been different. What you may not realize is that he was an active Marine Corps pilot and still flies his own helicopter and jet 40 to 50 hours a month. He is an FAA-designated aviation safety consultant. Mr. Bailey has won an award from the Aviation Space Writers Association for his writings on airline cabin safety, too. He was a, has a special place in his heart for the people of United, uh, one particular person from United, but he'll uh, tell you all about that in just a moment. Mr. Bailey is just a country boy who practices law as a hobby, but who is, in fact, the highest paid pilot in the world? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, F. Lee Bailey. Thank you very kindly. Please let me assure you all, I do not intend to accept a pay cut in the foreseeable future. My fiancé and the best friend I have in the world has worked for you, now San Francisco-based, for 22 years. Some years ago, I put her through every phase of flight training right up to, and including flight engineer's ground certificate, in the hope that she could become a United pilot, and then the layoffs began, and suddenly it was too late. Although she certainly can't claim the economic need under the circumstances, she will work for United for the indefinite future because she loves that airline and that job. And although it causes us to be separated, sometimes I respect her affection and dedication. Some years ago, when I had a nationwide TV interview show, and I mean so many years ago, <clears throat> in 1967, at 6 o'clock in the evening, I concluded an interview in the home of Jaja Gabor, hopped on my Learjet and flew all night to Providence, Rhode Island to argue a murder case before the Rhode Island Supreme Court, which was then dominated by a brilliant mind in the person of a blind judge named Powers. And we all knew that when we gave argument, although he couldn't read the briefs, they had to be read to him, he fastened on every word and forgot nothing. I had a difficult case. I had a convicted Young man, charge, murder in the first degree. We had picked up the case on appeal. He was guilty. And there was a bad flaw in his conviction. Legally, he might have been entitled to at least another trial. If I won the case, I felt an obligation to have him committed to a mental institution because I felt that he was dangerous. But I argued the case with all the vigor at my command, as was his entitlement. When the decision came down, a month or so later, written by Justice Powers, it said, although we accede to the brilliance of the argument put before us by counsel for the defense, after careful retrospective analysis, we have found it to be more plausible than sound, and we affirm the conviction. And I want to, as an analyst, a troubleshooter, and one who think, I think knows enough about this business to give some helpful insights do an analysis with you as to where this problem is and where it could go and what the future may hold. What I have just seen on television and what I viewed this morning in my hotel room on the same videotape is the most tragic picture that has been presented in this entire issue. Thirty-two and a half years ago, I boarded for the first time in my life at the ripe old age of 19 an Eastern Airlines Lockheed Constellation to fly from my home in Boston to Pensacola, Florida, to begin flight training as a Navy pilot. For 16 weeks, I was grounded for intensive ground school, as they had promised. And since that day, not one month has gone by in the history of my life that I have not flown something somewhere. I depend on aviation, both riding in your carriers and in my own very active aircraft, to keep my life together and to make it possible. And it has provi provided tremendous benefits. Had I not learned to fly as I did when I did, I'm confident you would never have heard my name 
the ability to make quick and correct decisions without faltering, absolutely essential to the dynamic give and take of a hot trial, are best taught in flight training. And if I ran a school for trial lawyers, I would make them all learn to fly under the worst conditions before I would graduate. By a different analogy, America has the attention span of a four-year-old. It does not see effectively down the road and anticipate, as pilots learn they must, to stay alive. Near-term vision good, long-term vision poor. If America were an airplane flown by our government and our corporate managers, it would crash. You pilots, by virtue of your presence in the many domiciles today, and your colleagues, the flight attendants who are with you, are here for one reason. You learned and disciplined yourselves to live by the rule that you never get behind an airplane or it will kill you. If you let it get even with you, you will get behind it. If you stay ahead of it, it is the most delightful instrumentality you'll ever meet in your life. And that is why, although I get a look, as trial counsel at almost every air disaster that occurs around the world through a firm that is specializing in exactly that and get to reconstruct with a great deal of help from many, many others how accidents occur. It is a blessedly rare occurrence, statistically almost impossible to occur. That is for, in my view, one reason. Somehow, through fluke or otherwise, the daring do of the early barnstormers became, through organization, dedication, and a realization of just exactly what their responsibilities were, the most professional group of human beings in existence in the world today, the professional pilots for air carriers. When I give lectures about the sorry state of the trial bar, where a lawyer may rate anywhere from a one to a nine, on a scale of 10, and the client seldom knows until the trial is halfway done whether he's got a bush leaguer or a pro as his spokesman. I always use an, as an example the consistent level of recurrently trained proficiency and discipline of the airline pilots. From the videotape you just saw, this is an historic day in the business of flying. Because depending on which way this day turns out, the era of that personality may have passed behind us. And a new, less professional, less dependable replacement will arise like a phoenix from the ashes, and those statistics will change. No one is more concerned about your proficiency than someone competent to do what you do, who does it almost for a living and does not have access to your flight instruments and an approach at minimums to see that the needles are crossed. My knuckles get white, but not very white, simply because I know that unless I am sitting in the back of some cheapo airline trying to cut costs in safety quadrants, I have not one, not two, but usually three chances to catch any mistake in split seconds before it can ripen into a tragedy, and that is all that that confidence is grounded on. I cannot see those instruments to reassure myself directly. Mr. Ferris has not spoken here today. I have a mutual friend who was the president of Fairchild, the division that makes the Merlin turboprop, which I drive and have for five years, named Tony Spurrier. I've never met Mr. Ferris, but he was his good friend and often spoke of him to me. I see no ad hominem attack on Mr. Ferris. Indeed, I think if I met the man, I would rather like him. However, whenever you get into combat with anyone, without weapons or with, he who does his homework best usually has the edge. If the sides are equally equipped with the evidence, and I am better prepared, I will almost always win, and vice versa. The day after I took the bar in 1960, I had the privilege to have luncheon with Edward Bennett Williams, then and now the king of the criminal defense. 
And I said to him, Mr. Williams, how do you so consistently seem to pull a rabbit out of a hat? And he said, I go to court with 50 hats and 50 rabbits, and sometimes I have a little luck, and that is the only way. I will make the statement which I have seen from the roadshow, which sums it all up. And you must examine the statement to see whether it is plausible or sound. If it's plausible, you'll be attracted to it. If it's sound, you have to buy it. Mr. Ferris says, ladies and gentlemen, the bare facts of life are these. Upstart airlines, the result of the deregulation, the fight for which I led, have caused pilot gluts to appear and work cheaply. Therefore, the economics of your job have been reduced to the point where you theoretically no longer exist in a competitive atmosphere. We are therefore painfully compelled to call upon you to reevaluate your value. And we must find a machinery to bring us down to the wage scale which lets us compete with People Express. That is the entire statement. Appended to it is, I am resolute, I must win, and I will win. You are crazy if you take me on. There is some plausibility to that statement. There is some plausibility. It sounds good. <clears throat> it is enough to win a case against a mediocre lawyer, a professional, as I hope to demonstrate, will dismantle it very quickly. Because as in my Rhode Island murder case, it is flawed, not once, but in several respects. First of all, the remedy sought to get from A to B, the new economic pilot who has been reduced in price for no logical reason other than the claim of competition. To get from A to B by the most divisive, crazy system I have ever heard of in my life, and which terrifies me. Two tier. Mr. Ferris says, and wisely so, he does not like it. He should not like it. It invites corporate suicide and a repeat of the steward experience that you just watched, sad as it is. To put a person in the right seat of an airplane from that second group and let him watch the fellow in the left seat being paid double the amount for the same job, thinking to himself, if this fellow should slip, and I make complaint, subtle or otherwise, and the company check pilot, who views him as a burdensome has-been, checks him and does not pass him, I may move to the left seat. Won't that be great teamwork? Won't that hostility make for the smoothly oiled and working machinery that can snatch safety from the jaws of disaster with a half-second to spare. It is literally the craziest mechanism I have ever heard, if the journey must be taken in the first place. But let's go on to issue two. Is the journey necessary? You've been told that this is a foregone mandate which must occur, and you must yield to it. The flaw in that is <clears throat> that although it may be easier to run an airline on a cost-plus basis, which is what regulated airline management was, it wasn't management at all. They were guaranteed a profit by the government who set the fares unless they made terrible mistakes and then they might have a loss. But in a competitive atmosphere, they say we're unable to do that without making you pay. We haven't figured out how. People's Express will take over the world. That is flawed because it makes the assumption that for 25 years the public has been grossly cheated as you have willingly and knowingly been paid twice what you're worth with every dollar coming out of my pocket as a passenger. 
Why was there during that time no discovery that this job was overpaid? I don't understand that. Number two, I have found in the corporate minutes of that great public company, UAL, no corporate plan to apply, by reason of economic necessity, a similar formula to the payment of management. There is no 53 percent cut. And the last point, is the economic mandate such ever in aviation that cost and safety can have a fight and safety must lose? If we yield to that possibility, we have thrown away those of us that have been in aviation 30 years and still live to tell about it the most precious thing we have, and it's not the paychecks we get from whatever source. It is the integrity to call yourself a person ready, willing, and able to assume the enormous responsibility of being a member of that team, and I don't mean just the cockpit team, that will take a complex piece of machinery, beautifully redundant in almost all of its systems but the wings, through enormous potential risk and bring it time after time after time safely from A to B, landing each time on the tires and stopping on the runway. Is that now some simple task? Has technology made flying so much different that we can put half-valued people up there to deliver that same superb track record? I have seen none of that. The risks that I encountered flying SNJs in primary have not abated due to good autopilots or better avionics. They have not made the job less demanding when something goes wrong. Because when something goes wrong now, there's more catching up to do. There was more information sitting there. And it's like a controller losing his radar scope, but first losing the tags. When I met the boys, they had no tags. They were shrimp boats. When they lost the scope, they had to go back to listening to everybody and keeping track of where they were, an almost impossible task. Now if they lose the tags, to go to manual control is enormously difficult, but they can do it. The pilot could lose his electrical system at 300 feet with the field at minimums and an approach speed of 115 knots right on the buck. And he has to save that airplane. Is that to be done by lowering the attractiveness of this job? I think not. The whole key to the issue that confronts you is printed on your buttons. I have been through labor actions before and I have mediated them. I will go from this place on United Airlines to New York where I've been assigned as one of two lawyers to work with counsel for the government of India and counsel for Union Carbide to settle through negotiation injuries to 50 to 100,000 victims of methyl isocyanide gas and to do it by July. And we are going to get it done, believe it or not. The most mammoth task ever heaped on the plaintiff's trial bar. We're going to get it done because we've decided that it can be done and we will do it with every ounce of good faith we've got. And this dispute can be settled if there is good faith. What are the risks from the other side as perceived? First, certain things have to happen or the carrier is in big trouble. If all the pilots stay out, that in and of itself will probably ruin the company's efforts. There is an absolute dependence on a winnowing away of the weakest from the throng, who, if they should ever make that tragic mistake, will make a second tragic mistake, and that is to reach the age of 60 with nothing left in them but what they may have in the bank and everything else given away. Number two, should the flight attendants and machinists deliver the support that is rumored and suggested, but not yet committed, the carrier is done. Because this is a giant risk. Mr. Ferris has to take it, you understand, if there's any chance of success, because 
you are the test case. There will never be another day like this. If United goes, TW, Delta, Eastern, Northwest, Pan Am are gone. Two-tier or something equally corrupt will be in, and that will be history, and you'll have the misfortune to live through the transition, which will be horrendous. If United can't be broken, the others will not fight. Mr. Ferris put them in the deregulation bucket, and it's his job to cure their problems if he can, and he is the spearhead by designation. And while I do not wish him well, he has to travel every possible avenue to try to deliver what is without doubt an implicit promise, at least and perhaps overt, to other chief executive officers of other airlines who are annoyed by People Express. And if they succeed, we will have pilots like the boy from Air Florida, and I mean boy, who with a grand amount of time in Cessna 150s didn't know what ice was and committed suicide with a bunch of passengers in a takeoff that I wouldn't have expected an astute student to even attempt. Those things will be inevitable, and that will be the hallmark of success. If I were running the airline, I wouldn't want it. If a miscalculation is made, there is a threat out there that may not concern you directly, but I'll tell you at the corporate level, as Howard Smith touched upon, it is the terror of the boardroom. If the losses start, and the stock falls, and the assets remain, and the company is undervalued, T. Boone Pickens is a short distance down the road. He will gobble up United Airlines faster, and give you your jobs back, by the way, gobble up United Airlines faster than the turkey that goes at Thanksgiving, and Mr. Ferris will not get a pay cut. It will be eliminated. Now, two-tier goes away if we answer the second question in the negative, and you have the answer to that question, not just United folk, all of you who are professional airline pilots or cabin attendants because you are next, and machinists because you'll fall in line too. For this and every other major carrier that has achieved an equitable pay base based on the responsibilities, the demands, the professionalism, and the skill levels which this job warrants in each of those functions. The military is not paying huge bonuses to pilots to re-up for no reason. They have to draw them away from the most attractive flying job in the world and the most attractive job gets and keeps the best pilots simply for that reason. So what you must do is simplicity itself. Look in the mirror and ask yourselves, am I worth what I'm being paid, or have I, for 20 years, conned the American public into thinking there were demands in this job that really don't exist? Am I just a driver who's there to watch the autopilot and make the takeoffs and landings in a world where nothing happens or is likely to? Am I the tail end of a group that will watch automation take me completely out of the cockpit and perhaps replace my flight attendants with robots and my mechanics with the same? Or is that just not going to happen? Because Mr. Ferris does have a chance to break your backs, and he perceives that it's real, and I predict that he will at least try it on, no matter what intelligence may show about the unity of the workforce. He will not try it for very long despite his declared statement, which I read and he repeated in Boston, I am going to hang in there for 30, 60, 90 days and have this airline back to speed in six months unless you, having looked in the mirror, fail to believe in the person you have interviewed and permit him to do it. Half of any battle is believing before entry as every marine pilot was told 10,000 times before he was given his wings. Believing before entry, no matter what the odds and the difficulties, 
that you will win. Any trial lawyer that cannot come up to that frame of mind does not work for me. The answer to the outcome, if there must be a confrontation, and I sincerely hope that good management, and you do have in many respects very good management, of both the airline and the union will see that this is an unnecessary risk. The pilots need not be downgraded. Let People's Express come up to speed. Don't haul United down. The measure of your success ought to be indexed if you can communicate and distribute well enough, because I know what the rules are for what you wear on the job, but every one of you who has looked in the mirror and passed the tests and has decided that in contradistinction to perhaps some mistakes of the past, both by this union and others, that a lack of cohesiveness has led to a divided front when divide and conquer is management's only weapon. You should have learned that, that that will not happen again, and that each of you will have, as I have done, a signal to the others of what's going on. Unbound as I am by your work rules, I shall for both of us, since my lovely fiance must respect the rules, wear my pin on the front side of my lapel until your problem has been solved. Thank you very much.